Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. Dry docks are one of the essential components of shipbuilding and maintenance. They are essentially concrete canals attached to waterways. After a certain amount of construction is complete, many shipyards will begin assembling the pieces inside an unflooded dry dock. When the boat is ready for launch, water is pumped into the canal until it becomes even with the water levels outside. Once this happens, the gate is open and the ship sails away. The opposite takes place when a boat needs repair or repainting. Once sailing into the flooded dock, powerful pumps slowly remove the water so that the hull of the ship can be accessed more easily. Dry docking differs slightly depending on the ship's size and the shipyard's capabilities. For instance, oil tankers are some of the largest vessels in the ocean. Therefore, they displace a lot of water as they move. That said, they cannot steer efficiently at low speeds. So tugboats and tow cables are often used to position them inside the dry dock. The boat must be placed directly above the supports so that it doesn't suffer any damage when the water is removed. Depending on the procedure or repair being performed, a vessel this size can spend over a year in a dry dock getting washed, blasted free of corrosive materials, and repainted with anti-fouling paint. Once the boat is ready to depart, the water is brought back in, and the vessel is moved out to sea with the help of several tugs. Once clear of the shipyard, it can enter the open sea or ocean. In some rare cases, large boats can perform some repairs while still at sea. However, in the case of severe damage or damage to parts of the ship located below the waterline, visiting a dry dock is usually the best course of action. Shipyards all around the world are equipped to take on these repair projects, which can range all over the spectrum from hull damage to engine failure and fire damage. Since dry docks range in size and depth, sometimes large boats that suffer damage need to travel further or even be towed hundreds of miles before they can be repaired. In extreme cases, special docking boats can be used to lift the damaged vessels out of the water and onto land. When it comes to massive 100,000 ton ships, one of the biggest repair challenges can be removing and replacing propellers. These massive props weigh thousands of pounds, meaning powerful cranes need to be used to support them as they're removed from the ship's drivetrain. Such an operation simply can't be accomplished in the open sea. What's more, removing the propeller is sometimes the only way to repair other problems with the ship's propulsion system.
Among the most important aspects of maintaining a vessel is keeping the hull clear of corrosive substances. Though barnacles, mold, and other living things can do severe damage to a hull rather quickly, the most common issue affecting underwater components is their saltwater environment. Over time, repeated exposure to the sea can start to remove the protective coatings of paint, get into cracks and seams, and even wear away the hull itself. With hydroblasting, Dry Dock Crews can remove all of this corrosive material and any remaining remnants of paint. Nearly all modern boats are painted with a special type of coating known as anti-fouling paint. This is especially true of large, ocean-going vessels made of steel and aluminum. These unique paints contain various chemicals, such as cuprous oxide or other copper compounds, as well as biocides. Both of these work to impede the growth of barnacles and other biohazards. Applied in layers, these paints also reduce the water's ability to corrode the ship's hull itself, while improving water flow over the surface. The United States military has several major contractors that produce its naval vessels. Among these are Newport News Shipbuilding, Mission Technologies, and Ingalls Shipbuilding. Such facilities extensively use very large dry docks some of which are big enough to support a full-size Nimitz-class aircraft carrier, like the USS Carl Vinson. Here at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Washington, the Carl Vinson is leaving after nearly a year of repairs and renovations, costing $367 million. At 101,000 tons and 1,100 feet long, it takes string coordination between a tugboat and dry dock crews to get the ship into the water safely. Fortunately, all of these individuals know not to rush, but to ensure the safety of the $10 billion vessel above all else. As with its non-military counterparts, the U.S. Navy has access to special floating dry docks as well. These come in the form of special self-contained platforms, or heavy lifting boats that can take on and release water to alter their depth. This more or less reverses the traditional dry dock process, with the platform flooding its ballast tanks in order to sink to an appropriate depth. The vessel is then maneuvered into place while the ballast tanks are slowly emptied. As this happens, the platform rises until the ship and the platform deck is above sea level. In some cases, the platform will have repair crews on board already. In other cases, it may be necessary to move the entire platform to a dockside facility. Painting is an important part of maintaining military vessels as well. For decades, the U.S. military ships have been covered in a color known as deck gray.
The reason is that this particular color helps the ship blend in with the horizon while moving at sea. Bright colors such as white or red are generally reserved for Coast Guard or hospital ships. At a certain distance, a gray warship will all but disappear from view. However, the U.S. Navy recently began considering painting its ships with a camouflage pattern. This was done by many countries back in the days of World War I and World War II. These various lines and patterns made it difficult for enemies to tell in which direction a ship might be traveling. Though many people don't think about it, the color and type of paint used on a vehicle can tell you a lot about its mission and purpose. Again, hospital ships are often painted white so that enemies know that they're not on hand to engage in combat but to tend to the wounded. The same strategy applies to military aircraft. The colors, patterns, and titles on each aircraft tell friendly and enemy forces which country and division the plane belongs to and what its role might be. During Vietnam, for instance, F-4 Phantoms were often painted with a green and beige scheme. This helped them blend into the canopy jungle below. Other color schemes might be applied to aircraft that perform different roles or are designed to operate in different environments. Over time, these paint jobs can become virtually synonymous with the planes themselves. This is why many military museums and facilities restore retired aircraft to their previous glory before putting them on display. The actual painting process used for full-size aircraft is quite extensive. First, the surface must be stripped of all previous paint. This avoids overweighting the aircraft. After that, three layers are applied, the primer, the base coat, and the top coat. The last of these can give the aircraft a shiny appearance often associated with commercial airliners. Military airplanes are coated with a thin layer of primer using handheld or motorized sprayers. Once this is in place, polyurethane paint is applied to multiple sections at once. Even with the benefit of lifts, cranes, and several painters, this process can take hours to complete. Afterward, designations, numbers, and warning symbols must be painted atop the main coat. This can take even longer, but few could possibly argue with the stunning results. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.